Hey guys, my name is Dr. Aaron Murtis, and I'm going to talk to you about this topic right here. So mostly this is for uh, Megan's class because she asked me to come and I was like, yeah, maybe I can come, maybe I can't. And then I had email back and forth and now I'm just making her life more difficult at this point. So I thought I would record something so that you guys can watch this uh, at your leisure and I won't be able to make it to your class probably unless there's a chance we can do it virtually. But either way, you can get this information and use it if you want. So uh, mostly this was uh, this topic. I, I wrote a book about this, and I'll show it to you in a second. But then some, I've had a few people ask me to come talk about the stuff that's in it. Uh, so I'm going to do that for you in case this is helpful. And maybe I'll add a few other little tidbits of you know other things that might be useful. So the class that, if you're here watching this for Megan's class, then uh, this is a forensic class, and you guys are all in an undergraduate program. Most of what I'm going to talk about here is relevant to graduate students and rehabilitation counseling because that's what I was and I have never been to an undergraduate rehab program. So uh, I'm going to try and tailor this as much as I can based on the jobs you have available. But just know that most of this is, I wrote this with the mindset that these are graduate students that are going to pursue this kind of stuff. So uh, with all those caveats in mind, let me... Get going. So first of all, I guess we don't need to worry about this too much, but here's the book. If you want it, I have a website. It's just myname.com, aaronmurtis.com, uh, and you can see, I think the video is cutting off. Let's see if I can, uh, the video is cutting off the bottom. I don't want to lose my captions, but we'll see if that helps a little bit anyway. Um, so you can go there if you want to buy it, or it's on Amazon too. Uh, and then there's a picture of me looking all fancy above. By the way, uh, Megan's class, if you're watching this for this, I specifically wore this as the requisite dress code for the day because isn't this what Midwestern lumberjacks are supposed to know or supposed to wear? <laughs> Just kidding. But uh, I grew up in Minnesota, and so I'm, I'm very comfortable in flannel, and I now live in Montana, which means flannel is like almost required uh, apparel. But anyway, I digress. So let's jump here. So I want to explain a little bit about the context of this, too. When I was thinking about how all these different jobs fit together under this big umbrella of rehab counseling, or in this case, uh, a Venn diagram, not an umbrella, I was trying to think what are the, what direct, what's like big skill sets do people need to know? Not specifically like the individual skills, but what big areas do people tend to gravitate towards? And so the three areas are listed here. One of them is career-related stuff. Oftentimes, we talk about rehab counseling as disability and employment, and it's that employment thing that we become experts in. We get to know about development through the lifespan, like how you know a person's career. This is like Donald Super, if you heard that name before. How a person's career develops from we think about things for as four-year-olds of like I want to be a baseball player or ballerina or whatever it is all the way through getting an actual job and how you get trained in high school and college and beyond, and then how you retire too and how that shapes the identity of who we are as people. So career is a really, really important part. The other part, of course, is disability. I'm gonna fix my camera because there's a big line going through the screen. <laughs> Real professional presentation, right? Um, disability is another big part of it because that affects what work we have available to us and what kind of jobs we can do and how our economy, what skills are needed to do for you know economic transactions amongst each other, but also just who, how it shapes who we are as people too. So disability is a very important part of this. And the last part is the counseling part. Now here's where a little uh, caveat comes into play. S of course, if we're gonna do therapy, I call it therapy here. I, I debated whether I should call it like mental health or something like that, but we have these big fields of psychology and counseling and social work and all that kind of stuff. And rehabilitation as it started, and this is, I won't go into the details of the history, but it kind of started around maybe roughly like 19 teens, 1920s, something like that. And it wasn't until about 1950 that the rehabilitation community working on disability and employment aligned with the counseling profession. Now it's very much aligned and it's actually moving kind of more in that direction, but the counseling profession doesn't understand as well these two things, disability and career. Sort of career sometimes, but disability not so much. So as you're conceptualizing what kind of skill sets do I want to be involved in, you can have any kind of combination of these different things. There's a lot of people that want to be therapists, but we really need people to work with 
uh, new mothers who are having kids and they just found out they're going to live with Down syndrome or autism or something like that. And so we need this intersection here to do therapy with people who have chronic illnesses or disabilities, right? If you uh, really want to focus on career and the labor market and how um, how people get jobs, but also struggle interpersonally on jobs or managing, uh, you know, organizational culture or something, there is there are career counselors for that. That could be individual counseling, or if you want to talk about a crossover profession, the profession of psychology has a whole subfield called or, uh, industrial organizational psychology, or IO psychology. And that's kind of this stuff, career counseling. And then, of course, traditionally, what rehab has, rehabilitation counseling has always been about is employment and disability. And so anybody who works for state voc rehab kind of fits into this category. They don't really do diagnosis. They do uh, some work with um, like motivational interviewing. It's sort of uh, brief solution focused kind of therapeutic techniques. But they're not really interested in deep psychoanalysis and that kind of stuff. So they kind of stay away from these parts right here. So this hopefully gives a little bit of context. And what I tried to do in the book then is say, given these different careers, oh yeah, and by the way, your education, you're sort of trained for all these things. Now, depending, this is for Megan's class specifically, depending on what the focus is of that undergraduate program, I imagine you're learning a lot more of this and this stuff gets left out. In other words, get prepared to understand disability, career, and a lot of the therapeutic stuff gets left out. I could be wrong about that, but there's a lot more case management involved in, in doing vocational rehab traditionally as it, as it relates to employment and disability. And those are extremely important things. This is kind of a contentious thing, but one of the things I find with students in my program, in the grad program, who come in and say, like, I want to be a therapist. And then I make them sit through all kinds of classes on career and disability. And like, I don't know why this matters to me. And so after we get through a couple of weeks and they're like, okay, I kind of understand how this matters. But there's still this sense of like, but that's not what I want to do. And I say it with that tone because it feels to me like this. I'm in it for the prestige or this kind of work because it's cooler and I, it's sexier and it makes me feel better as a professional, which is totally fine. And I support them in that decision and you and yours, if that's what you're making. But these things are so related and so important. And case management is one of those things that people say it's hard, it's time consuming, it takes a bunch of work, but man, isn't that important. If you were at a position in your life where you didn't have uh, the right kind of medications, or you didn't have access to health care, or you didn't have access to enough finances because you're out of work due to a disability, all of a sudden those, those case management skills and having somebody help you with that becomes insanely important. And so I really try to not be too flippant, and I don't want to make fun of anybody, but to really put this in context for like, yeah, therapy is important, but so is addressing the disability and how that impacts a person's ability to work and their mental health, all those things combined. So hopefully that context helps as I talk about this stuff because I split up the book in these different sections. They're kind of arbitrary and the way I'm gonna talk about it is sort of arbitrary because all this stuff works together. You're just sort of falling into focusing professionally on different tasks or maybe having needs in different areas. So. Hopefully that helps. Um, I'm going to skip over kind of most of this stuff because I don't know that it's totally relevant to uh, to you guys in the class. But this is more for uh, graduates who come out of rehabilitation counseling programs who are interested in professional issues. Uh, so I guess I'll mention a little bit just in terms of it might be interesting to you. Maybe it's not. But one of the prime the primary kind of gold standard certification for if you're going to do rehabilitation counseling work is to get a CRC certification or become a certified rehabilitation counselor. That's what the CRC means over there. The field is changing though. And I mentioned that kind of started back maybe roughly a hundred years ago ish, maybe just slightly more. Uh, and it then evolved to be more part of the counseling community. And then the counseling world is changing and we're the whole in introduction of technology and big data. It's changing the way we, the information that we have and the way we understand disability and then the profession itself is changing too so what essentially this is, is kind of a list of things that at least anecdotally from my perspective i see changing in the field so maybe it's relevant to you maybe it's not but uh, i'll just briefly cover what some of these things are the rehabilitation service administration or rsa funding 
is changing. And I say changing, but what I really probably mean is reducing. And the funding that comes from the Rehab Service Administration, which is a part of our United States government, really reflects changing in political attitudes towards disability-related issues. And it has for quite some time. I'm not going to go into the details. Uh, I'd love to. It sounds fun to me. But <laughs> whether it's useful to you and your career decision-making may or may not be. But I will say this for the sake of the forensic class. A lot of cultural events were happening in the early 1900s that facilitated a lot of public interest in creating laws for people that were in industrial jobs and then get industrial related accidents or were going off to World War I, II, Vietnam, et cetera, and then coming back with service related injuries. So there's a lot of public interest in that. Then there was a great period through the 60s, 70s, and 80s where it just, you know, we don't want to support those kind of things. And private industry was growing. And that's when uh, private rehabilitation really started to take off, when the private industry started to work through this stuff. Because of the presence of uh, legislated, in, legislated laws, sounds kind of redundant to say that, but laws that were created by the government, not defined by the court system, kind of in the judicial system, because of that, some laws are legislated into action and some laws are applied and sort of changed and tweaked after they become legislation. And that's where forensic work gets to sort of do this crossover between what are the laws as written, what are the laws as interpreted, and then what data do we have to support our understanding of all those things. So we're not going to get really into what that means, but as it relates to changes in funding, it's really the story about cultural attitudes towards disability and how we engage with the rules. There was a lot more interest in legislating things from the public perspective as government is supposed to function by you know the people caring about things and then sending them upwards to you know big decision makers. And now we're doing a lot more of applying laws and interpreting them based on the data that we have. So that's why forensic counseling is still active and uh, completely relevant and important and why I think this stuff still kind of has a place in our rehab world, even though public interest seems to be declining and funding is declining, all that kind of stuff. So a whole lot more to say about that, but we won't talk too much. Accreditation, I'm just going to skip over that one for the sake of our conversation now, but really that has more to do with professional identity. At one time we were, uh, I guess I'm not skipping over it, <laughs> sorry, but at one time we were uh, rehabilitation people, that's just our sort of title. We weren't a profession, we just sort of did a job. And then it became a profession and aligned with the counseling world and kind of the medical world around the 1950s. And now aligning more so with counseling by changes in accreditation, you don't have to really worry about what that means too much. But uh, it is creating a, an interesting relationship with the therapeutic world and our understanding of mental health conditions also very much as our culture acknowledges mental health conditions, we get to figure out how do we accommodate those in the workplace, which is a whole tricky thing that you guys get to live through the progress of that and participate potentially in solutions to that. So interesting stuff. Uh, licensing board recognition, we'll skip over that, but if you choose to get licensed as a mental health counselor, additionally to your certify, any certifications that you may carry, uh, there's some changes in that world, too. The legal world is thriving. I kind of already mentioned that. Uh, this other thing about students don't do rehab, because of the perception that a lot of us as students have about, like, I want to do therapy because that's on the minds of people, and it has there's prestige in that world right now, and there's a lot of uh, expectation from students believing that they understand what that world is, and I won't say that they're wrong or you're wrong because it may not be the case, but people have, it's just like when, you know, your grandparents were like, oh, you're going to be a doctor, right? That's what, you know, doctor is the most prestigious thing. They love the wonderful parts about that, but they don't say, well, I'd like you to work 18 hour days and be stressed out all the time because <laughs> some doctors are, right? They're thinking, I want you to have a stable and secure life. So we have sometimes really accurate and sometimes not so accurate misperceptions about what jobs are. And when people say they don't do rehab, I suspect it's because they think the world of mental health is a lot more attractive and, and prestigious. 
and that rehab just isn't. That's a PR problem, not so much a problem with the work, right? Once you, the fun part as a professor that I get to engage in is that once I tell people about what rehab actually is, they're like, oh, that's actually really more relevant and important than I thought it was. I still don't like the way it makes me feel, but I see the value. And so that's part of the fun transition of being a professor is I get to share some of these things and hopefully help people just understand the world more accurately. It's not about trying to improve the public relations perspective of rehab. It's about telling people the real story, hopefully, and uh, us adjusting how we're gonna contribute and give back to other people through the kind of work that we engage in. So uh, retirement attrition, what that essentially means is that the great crowd from the 1950s, 60s, 70s, and 80s that were getting into the field when it was growing and becoming something is now retiring out. And that does a couple things. One, we need to backfill with new students that have interest in this stuff so that we can keep the field alive. But also that means there isn't enough people going into this because of the perception of what it is, which creates this kind of vacuum. So if you're in this, watching this right now, there's more people retiring than there are coming in, which means you'll probably have a lot of professional opportunity for you in the future, which is a really great thing for you. So probably enough said about that right now. Uh, the pass rates of the CRC exam are down. That's more of a conversation for us academics to get our act together. I think that's the, the professional, politically correct way to say it. That's not to say that, that it's our entirely you know, on educators. If you're a student watching this, you might be like, yeah, but it kind of is. You guys are a little weird, <laughs> which may be the case. But uh, I think there's a responsibility that we have, but it's also a bigger issue that involves uh, participation with professional organizations and uh, private uh, communities, I guess. Um, like, yeah, I get cultural. How do I want to say this? It involves the participation of uh, people on the front lines doing the work, of academics, of uh, people doing political advocacy, uh, and just cultural perspective and awareness, that kind of stuff too. So it's a bigger bigger issue, but we'll just blame academics right now, since I am one and I feel like I can do that. <laughs> I'll take that on. Uh, too many professional organizations. You guys want a community, I imagine, that you can learn with and be a part of something. And there are just so many of them that you guys have to make choices, which kind of makes it hard for you because you only have so much money and so much time. And you have too many options. And you don't necessarily know where to go about uh, becoming involved and being a part of something. So that just creates a, another diffusion of, of identity is kind of how we talk about it. Just a few uh, uh, pointers. There was a CRCC, the Commission on Rehabilitation Counselor Certification. I almost got that wrong. That'd be embarrassing. Uh, there was a, a survey done, and 80% of the participants of the survey were from state voc rehab, and there were a bunch of people from private rehab in the private sector as well. But because of that, uh, the average income of CRCs is listed to be $74,000 uh, annually. Uh, I see that I left out a, a number there. That, sh that should be three zeros, but typo, my bad. Um, when, when that was posted, there was some discussion about, well, that's not how much I make. And a lot of people who work for state rehab say, oh, that's not this, that number is not accurate. And so I just wanted to address the, the, uh, that it's kind of skewed data or it can be perceived. If you look at the bottom number, the average income of IARP, or the International Association of Rehabilitation Professionals, which is one organization primarily focused on private rehab, the average income was 150000 So what you're looking at there is the income of rehabilitation counseling can go anywhere from 40000 to 300000 and in private rehab, there's a potential to make a lot more. Now, as we go through this, I won't probably go into too much detail, but there's... Um, the, the jobs are different, and the kind of work that you do is different. And so I want to address some of the philosophical and cultural things related to you know the ethics of where people are, because that really matters to, to you depending on where you want to go with your career. But here's the numbers. I'm just kind of sharing them with you. And those are ballpark figures. Those aren't like 100% accurate. Um, in order to keep this a little bit shorter and not too long, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try and be... Uh, I'm not known for brevity, but I'll try and be as brief as I can. So here are some of the vocation-focused careers, primarily in the forensic arena. Now, in the book that I showed you earlier, there's more of them, but those are non-forensic focused. And so I tried to kind of whittle this down a little bit for this 
for this audience, really. Um, Social Security expert witness. Essentially what that person does. The Social Security Act was passed in 19... Oh, crap. I shouldn't have even started the sentence because now I'm going to get this wrong. But uh, it was part of the Franklin Delano Roosevelt, the FDR New Deal that came out of the stock market crash of 29... (laughs) <laughs> Crap, I should have checked my dates before I started this. 1929, the stock market crash, which led into the Great Depression, and that changed the perception of what the federal government's role is in our lives to, to basically protect us. And the Social Security system is essentially an insurance program to say it originally was just for the elderly, but then became for uh, people with disabilities and you know other folks. That essentially says we need to protect people through an insurance program. And when people go to apply for that insurance and say, hey, I've actually just gotten a disability or chronic illness, and now I'm not able to work, so I'd like to take out those benefits that I've been paying into as a worker for my, my working life. And you have to be eligible for the program. And so if, if the Social Security system says, actually, your disability doesn't qualify, you have the opportunity to appeal. And then you submit some documentation and you go to these special hearings with these special kind of judges called administrative law judges. I think they're called that because they're administering the law. Pretty creative, right? So uh, it's this really kind of specialized and unique court process specific to Social Security work. And what the judges know is they know the law like the back of their hand. And the people applying or appealing uh, their disqualification they know their life and their disability. But what few of those people know, and sometimes there's there's attorneys involved in that process too, what they don't know is they don't know the labor market. So they hire or contract with rehabilitation counselors to say, you guys know disability and you know the labor market. That's that disability and career stuff. Now tell me, given this person's unique disability, would they be able to work? If the answer is yes, they could work, there's enough jobs in the American economy to, uh, for them to find one, then it's expected that this person, even with their disability, could probably go out and work and thus won't need benefits. However, if there aren't enough jobs, then their disability probably would qualify as uh, needing that insurance, and so they would get those benefits. And that's a really rough kind of brief explanation of what that is. But the the sub-bullet points here say this is kind of one of those places where people can get into the field. Part of the reason why it's considered to be entry level is because there aren't defense attorneys cross-examining you. It's usually one advocate, sometimes attorneys are called advocates, one advocate for the person with a disability, a judge, and the judge is really fully in charge of determining whether this person is eligible or not. So... Uh, for the expert witness in the process, you're not being hired by the attorney and cross-examined by some other attorney and they're grilling you in this really tedious process. It's really the judge saying, is your data good? And if the data is good, then we can accept it and use it to make our decisions. So uh, it's a little bit less stressful and intense. Um, The income. What is the income for this position? Well, there's no real good way to say what the annual income is of people because it's on. they pay on a case-by-case basis. So if you accept one case, you get an X amount of dollars. I think I'm going to get this wrong because I don't actually know, but I think it's roughly around $120, $25, something like that. Um, some of you may actually know this, and I don't, so share with your peers if you do. But uh, you get paid per case, which means you don't get a salary. There are people that you can work for that will pay you to do this kind of work, but then you get paid less because they take a cut of whatever that fee is from the government, and then you do the work, and they just help with the, the kind of the head hunting. They find you and give you the cases and that kind of stuff. One of the things you need to know, though, is you need a blanket purchase agreement, which is just a piece of paper that says, I have a contract with the government to do this kind of work. There's some details of how to get that. But for you, getting into this, you just need to find somebody who does this, who has a BPA, and you'll be able to kind of work under them, under their supervision, which is great because then you kind of like learn the ropes and get trained too. Um, the workers' compensation system is another insurance system, only it's run not by the federal government, but by each individual state government. Most of you probably have heard of what this means. You know, workers' comp claims are for people that roll their ankle when they're at work or, you know, get their heads chopped off or something. 
I'm being facetious. You don't go to for, you don't get workers' comp benefits if you get your head chopped off. That's a different story. But you get the idea, right? Um, it can be a way to get into the field because you can start doing quote unquote rehab work. If you get hired by somebody who's doing workers' comp type things, you might get hired to help. Uh, update resumes of work comp clients, or you might go to their uh, medical visits with them, and you're doing a little bit more like case management stuff to enter. But on the advanced end of that, you might also be getting calls from attorneys who say, hey, I have a client here, can you do a vocational evaluation to, to see about their vocational potential? And there's a, there's a kind of more advanced processes or ways of going about that, different psychological evaluations you can use, different functional evaluations you can use. Uh, but it's really determining, can this person go back to work in their same job? Can they stay with their same employer? Do they need to find a new occupation and get retrained, like through a you know vocational training program or college or whatever it is? Um, so it can be complicated. It can also be not as complicated. Uh, and so it's a great way to break into the field, but also something you can do throughout your entire career. And there's lots of room for advancement and professional development. Uh, here again, the income is variable too because it really depends on how much you're charging if you're working independently, how much somebody's paying you. It depends on the state you're in. Uh, there's lots of different laws and rules and regulations because every state is different. So it's hard to say. But I've seen, just to give you a sense, I've seen people who do work comp or uh, just work within that system who can make close to the average, if not plenty more than average of that IRP survey, so 150000 if you don't want to work like crazy and you want to have less time off, you can still make your $50,000 a year and be satisfied with that and not live a stressful life or something. So they can really vary there. Um, the Veterans Affair Vocational Rehab Counselor, I include that one here, even though that's kind of not necessarily in the, um, if you're talking about working as a voc rehab counselor for the VA, it's not necessarily a forensic position, and it's not even necessarily private because it's working for the federal government. But what I'm talking about here more is consulting with, as a rehabilitation counselor, consulting with the VA. And here's what I mean by that. Uh, when I was in doc school, I just through word of mouth and the people that I knew, I found out that there was this company who was being who who acquired a grant from the government to find rehabilitation counselors, and I happen to be in the state of Iowa to do evaluations for voc rehab clients. Essentially what that meant was the voc rehab counselor had a big caseload. They didn't have time to go drive around the state to all these people's houses and do these evaluations. But essentially, if there was a person who was on 100% disability and still was getting benefits through voc rehab, that means they were deemed unemployable. And so the voc rehab counselor said, well, I can't help them find work. But what I can help them do is see if they, if they can stay functional and uh, healthy and alive in their communities. So I would essentially get paid to go drive to their house, do an independent living evaluation on their uh, any home modifications needed, uh, set up uh, social structural things, like if they're staying at home too much, is there a way we can help build in some social uh, connections with them? Uh, and talking about kind of home modifications was primarily what it was, but a lot of assistive technology, assistive devices, and that kind of thing. So I got to give uh, a report back to the VA, and they just paid me on a case-by-case -case basis. I said 500 bucks, that's what I got paid, but it could be different depending on the grant and who's running it. Uh, a transition counselor, this is not uh, pre-employment transition services or pre ets as it's known in the state programs. Uh, this is somebody who works with that same population, but just on a private basis, and I've heard stories of people doing that. If you're working on a private basis, you probably want to know a little, quite a bit or a little bit about that age group and about what transitioning out of special education programs mean. So uh, you'd really want some specialized knowledge in the education system in addition to disability employment and therapy too. So that's kind of a unique skill set. And the income, of course, you set your own fees if you're working privately for yourself, so that really just depends. But typically, a normal fee for that, uh, what I've seen a lot of people do is they use either their set forensic fee, which might be two, $300, or they might say, based on the compensation of like what the insurance company will reimburse for an hour of therapy, which some places it's 175, some places 125. So a normal 
sort of starting price, depending on how you set things up, is like 150 bucks or something like that, which is pretty industry standard for counseling at large. Um, private career counselor, that is what it sounds like. It's providing career uh, resume writing, interview preparation, um, uh, networking support or you know advice on networking, um, how to, I already said prepare for interviews, but that's a lot of what that is. It's essentially saying, how do you make that transition? There's a difference between counseling through that process and dealing with the psychological adjustment process and coaching, kind of just cheerleading and supporting people and be getting this new job and helping them with the stress and managing how many applications they have out and who they've responded to and how to how to make sure you edit your responses so you're not responding to one employer with a different employer's name on it or something like that, because that happens sometimes. Uh, typically, this happens in a private pay. There's no insurance that'll reimburse for this kind of thing. And so uh, it's Usually the fees are a little bit lower, but um, there's there's people who are making a living doing this kind of thing right now. Typically, the places that I see people doing that are on social media, just because that's the way you attract uh, clientele. You almost it seems like you almost have to be online, and you have to be like creating social media content to attract people to want to use your services. That's how I see it happening the most, but. And then a family law vocational evaluator. This is people who are dealing with custody issues or divorce-related stuff. A uh, typical kind of story is a husband or wife worked, and they have to figure out how to split up the assets. And so they say, well, how much work potential does one person have and the other person have? A lot of times uh, what I hear is related to like alimony issues uh, and because we know career and sort of labor market stuff, if somebody was out of the labor market for a while and we have to evaluate, well, what's their potential to earn even though they haven't been earning? How do we, if we don't have numbers from a paycheck, how do we decide that? And so that's kind of where we could potentially fit in. There's other ways too, but that's, a, that's an advanced thing. It's, it's tough work to get involved in those often contentious uh, divorce cases and stuff like that, so. And then general vocational consultant, uh, I'm not going to go into what that is, but that's just kind of like a catch-all for there's other stuff that you can do with this too, but I've kind of talked about most of it. Now let's talk about the disability-focused uh, careers. And I realize I'm at a, uh, about 32-ish minutes, almost 32 and a half, so I'm going to try and speed up a little bit. I always say that and never do. i got to stop saying that one of these days. Uh, even though I talk fast, there's just a lot to cover, and so I... I want to share this with people because I think it's interesting and valuable. So, uh, I don't know. You can shut it off if you need to, I guess, and I'll just quit apologizing. How about that? Uh, to work for an insurance company. Insurance company, we've mentioned that term a couple times, Social Security, Work Comp, and then there's private insurances. This is becoming familiar with short-term disability policies. And when people have a short-term disability and they have this policy, a lot of us who have benefits and our employers can afford insurances like this, we have these benefits, but we don't know what they mean. And we don't know how a rehabilitation counselor can help. The reason that rehabilitation counselors are hired by insurance companies is because it's cheaper to provide somebody professional support in getting back to work than it is to just let them sit on their benefits until they run out. So that's just kind of in a nutshell why. There's short-term disability, there's long-term disability, and there's other kinds of uh, vocational case management you can do. But this is a, um, the people that I've talked to say typically we start people at like $50,000, especially if they're in a grad program and they have a certain skill set. That could be $50,000 during your internship and then can go up to after a few years of experience and the appropriate certifications, it can be closer to $70,000. That's kind of where people sit around their career. But if you continue on in it and you make that your life's work, it can be upwards of ninety or hundred or even more. So. That's kind of the income range that one could expect. This is where uh, I see a lot more people interested in this kind of work, but I also hear a lot more reservation about the ethics of this. In the disability world, there's plenty of distrust about big systems. Even though they're here to support us and help us stay out of hot water, if we didn't have work comp or social security, we wouldn't have that money to fall back on. And yet the systems are big and complicated and sometimes dysfunctional and broken. And private systems are more focused on uh, shareholder profits because that's how capitalism works. 
And so there's lots of different opinions about whether this is the right place to be and whether it really promotes uh, the philosophy and values of what the disability community wants or needs. I don't want to get into the contention there and it's fun to have those conversations. Uh, but those are the things that I hear. And I just want to share that with you. It's not just insurance. It's a lot of this forensic work is there's ethics there. And are you making, are you contributing to more of the problem or are you really actually doing something of value? Uh, I hear those ethical conversations, but the more I spend time in the private rehab community, the more I, here's my opinion about what I perceive, and this is just my own. There are people who are doing it wrong, and there are people who are doing it right. It's not about the work itself, it's about how you engage in it. Just like every Disney movie with some hero with, some, with a sword, they're like, you have the power for good and evil and wield it appropriately, you know, that kind of thing. So uh, you can use your education to be powerful. The question is, how do you apply it and what decisions do you make throughout? So I'll just kind of leave that there, but um, insurance is where that conversation seems to come up uh, frequently. Life care planning. So the, the quickest and easiest way I can describe life care planning is case management on steroids. Imagine if someone came into you and uh, said, well, I'd like to get a job, but I have to also make sure I make enough money to uh, pay for these services and these medications, and this job has to understand about my medical conditions so that I can make sure I get to my medical appointments. And you as the case manager are like, okay, well, how many medical appointments do you have? How much do your medications cost? And then you map out all of those different services that need to be accounted for, and then you help them sort of figure out life, right? That's what case management kind of is in a nutshell. Life care planning is often for people who need those case management services planned out for the rest of their life. So let's say someone gets in a car accident, simple example, and they were working as a, well, I'll use a real example. They were working as a, uh, a logger and, appropriate to my dress code today, right? They were working as a logger or a lumberjack. We'll call them a lumberjack. And they were they owned their own company and they made $150,000 a year. Their take-home pay was 70. And now they have physical pain. They have additional medical expenses and a reduced potential for income. And so the rehabilitation counselor and life care or life care planner, there's different, different professions that engage in the practice of life care planning. But essentially what we're here to say is, okay, based on this person's injuries, What's the likely uh, cost of future medical appointments for the rest of their life? Do they need orthopedics? Do they need uh, medications? And how much are those going to cost over the lifespan? And then what's their reduced earning capacity? You do a bunch of math, calculate all that out, and you say, okay, here, court system, judges, attorneys, or whoever, here's what I came up with. And my best, my best estimate of what I think this will would likely cost and then they take that and they figure out how to deal with, you know, who's responsible and all that stuff. But that's essentially what life care planning is. It is complicated and it's messy and it's stressful and it's incredibly rewarding and it's challenging and stimulating and it's all of those things together. So this is not something you'd start out doing, uh, but it is something you can grow into. And after years of practice and, you know, getting comfortable uh, with the case management process, you can kind of I don't know, I don't want to say beef it up, sorry to all you vegetarians, <laughs> but you can just get better at it and then it, you can do this kind of thing. Um, accommodation specialist, if you work for a, a large organization that has many employees and the employees get injured on the job, maybe they're going through a work comp claim because they got injured on the job or even off the job, but now they say, I'd like to still work here, I just need a different position, that's where you get to come in because we understand job duties and what people can and can't do and what constitutes the necessary functions of a job and what things can be accommodated to continue on with the work. So uh, there are big employers that hire. Google, Amazon, uh, you know, and any big box store, Walmart, Target, Home Depot, all those places have somebody like this probably on staff to help out. Smaller companies can't afford us to do that kind of work, but they do contract that kind of work out to be an accommodation specialist. So those things exist as well. Uh, college disability specialists. This is essentially the same as an accommodation specialist, only it's unique to the education system. Every college is required to have one, so they have somebody who's helping make sure that the educational content is accessible. So 
I'm not going to say a lot about that just for the sake of time, but uh, the people that get into those kind of jobs, I very rarely see people leave except for retirement because they're stable. People like university culture and they, uh, the, the work is consistent and usually pretty pleasant. So um, it's hard to get into that, but once you get into it, people tend to stay just because the life, work-life balance and lifestyle is pretty good in that kind of work. Uh, sometimes colleges have career centers. Sometimes you'll see things around different towns called like staffing agencies or employment agencies. Those are slightly of a slightly different thing, but they're definitely within the wheelhouse of our specialty. Whether they can pay enough and whether they're, uh, I don't know, whether they're a good fit for, for our skill set is kind of up to you to decide or it's debatable, but um, they do really important work. They help people oftentimes with disabilities find work within the community, and they do a lot of the same stuff that rehab counselors do, which is make relationships with employers and then uh, help support the connection. What they miss out on a lot of times because they don't have the expertise of rehabilitation counselors is they miss out on a lot of the advanced evaluation that we can do. Uh, in other words, to, to facilitate long-lasting and stable employment opportunities, these tend to be places where, and no shame to anybody who's working in this area or who knows about this stuff, because they're really, really important. But people who go into those kind of a staffing agency and then get a job, oftentimes those jobs are only temporary. Nothing against the agency, it's just there is need for temporary work in our economy. And so people that can't hold down stable work because of their disability or illness, they end up in places like this where they end up just kind of cycling. And it's just part of the system. It's you know neither good nor bad, but those things exist. A college career center or one of the one-stop career centers that some communities have, it's not necessarily the same as a staffing agency, although they kind of fall into doing some of the same tasks. Resume development, in, uh, relationships with employers, um, working with the same demographics of people, disability, not disability, it all kind of falls into similar things. One of them's usually private, the other one's usually public. So it seems like there's recognition that we need these services. The question is, are we setting them up appropriately for long-lasting employment opportunities, or are we providing the best services to help people find the good fit? That's a different story. But uh, foster care advocate for people with disabilities who are in the foster care system, helping train parents to understand um, what it means to care for a a child with a disability. I've heard of rehabilitation counselors on a on a case by case basis. Nobody does this full time for their work. Uh, but if you know about uh, if you understand things like parenting skill sets and what it's like to work with kids with disabilities, uh, this can be a place to do that too. But it does require that kind of unique skill set. So for those for you young punks out there who are just getting out of your high school and you're not having kids yet, this maybe isn't the place to go. That's why I say it's intermediate level. <laughs> but um, anyway, uh, elder care. There's been, for years, people have been talking, uh, and by people I mean at least one other person that I know of who's been writing about this named Phil. And Phil wrote a really great article about, you know, what are the potential changes in the disability and rehabilitation world? And one of them is in elder care. And I think there's still this recognition that, hey, we got to figure out this, you know, how we're going to support the, um, our, our parents and our grandparents. And it's a big cultural and philosophical question for us, but it's also an economic and policy question. And I think there's room for us in the rehab community to decide, like, where do we fit here? So I'll just kind of leave it at that. But Life care management, it's a little bit like life care planning, only it's its more the people that I know doing this are usually nurses and they help facilitate getting, they'll get hired by like an attorney and the attorney usually finds out about the family because the family goes to the attorney and says, hey, we have these assets and we have mom and we have to figure out what to do with her estate and the attorney will help with this, but they'll be like, well, I don't know about the healthcare facilities around here. And so they'll call a nurse to say, hey, can you find a good site for grandma? Because she needs a place to go. Where rehabilitation counseling could fit into this, and I don't know how many people are actually doing this right now, but where they could fit in is like, there's a lot of stressful family relationship stuff that comes up in that process. And so having a person who not only understands uh, elderly care facilities, 
the progression of ability or uh, regression of ability, progression of disability throughout the end, or end stages of life, knowing about that kind of process and how families adjust seems like a thing that we could probably do, right? So if you have that therapeutic stuff, which again, you guys may not have all that stuff, but if you have that skill set, boy, that's a great place for you to fill in. I just don't know if anybody's doing that work right now, but man, it seems like there's an opportunity there because if you've ever lived through having to uh, work with a gr getting a grandparent to a, uh, a memory care facility or, I don't know, splitting up who gets the furniture after a parent passes away or whatever, like those things are just hard, right? So uh, that's an opportunity. Uh, veterans Benefit Advocate. Essentially, the veteran system has their own legal structure and they have their own kind of court system when people say they've been court-martialed and stuff it's what they're meaning is like we went through the the veteran or the military legal system and there are people that get certified to kind of help through that process one of my first mentor mentee experiences was i called this guy who was a rehab counselor and i was like i want to know what it is that you do can i come shadow you for a day and he's like sure come along with me so i went down to this place in minneapolis and he was hired by a veteran's advocate. A woman came to this advocate and said, hey, can you help me figure out my disability benefits? And you know, based on the time that I was in the military and there was a, some traumatic experience that were involved in there, the advocate was helping her navigate that system. The rehabilitation counselor, he was a psychologist, but the rehabilitation person was helping do an evaluation on employability and um, psychological well-being. So that's kind of how we could fit into that system. But if you want to become an advocate in the VA system, you have a skill set for that maybe. Um, and that's why I leave it here. It's sort of a forensic environment uh, in nature. Um, rehabilitation hospital counselor. That one kind of speaks for itself, but there's need for people to support families and reemployment efforts. And uh, it's not specifically therapy, but it's like, you know, case management and getting back into a new lifestyle and adjustment to disability in that way. Independent living. Uh, this isn't really particularly forensic, but there's a lot of law and policy that goes along with uh, opening a group home or things like that. And the trends of community reintegration as we shut down hospitals in the 1950s and 60s and started sending back the people in the community because it's the right thing to do even though now, ironically, we're still sending our uh, elderly folks away into these facilities, aw almost away from our communities in some cases, uh, but we're acknowledging that people don't belong isolated out in the middle of nowhere. We need to bring them back in with us and take care of them. That's what independent living movement essentially is. And so there's uh, lots of room for us as understanding disability and career sometimes falls in that too, but that's a whole other uh, can of worms that I'm not going to go into right now. If you've heard of sheltered workshops and things like that, there's a lot of controversy on whether those are a good thing or a bad thing or whatever. But, And then, of course, uh, assistive technologist. That's a position title that I just made up. I don't think it ever exists. But there are people who, who are experts in accessibility and web development. There are people who know how to code with accessibility in mind to make uh, online uh, commercial platforms more accessible, not just on the web, but even just like private software accessible for screen readers and for, um, you know, like when people talk about Steve Jobs, how he made things so intuitive, it's that, to use a term, universal design, which means it works for everybody to have disability in mind and be able to advise people who are architects who are building buildings and architects who are building web pages and, and engineers who are building, uh, you know, new um, IoT devices or... Um, what does IoT stand for? Internet of Things. So like all your like uh, light bulbs that are connected to your app and your garage door opener and your ring cameras and all that kind of stuff. Those are Internet of Things devices. Making sure those are accessible in ways that work for people with disabilities. There's a huge environment that's ripe for us to do our work there too. Um, I think I'm going to mostly skip over some of this stuff, but uh, in terms of disability therapists, 
there is room in the forensic community or environment to to become a therapist and then inform the courts about how these things uh, affect things like families and relationships. But that just looks a little bit different. The forensic work in psychology where you see it on like on Netflix all the time where there's some psychologist working with serial killers and murderers and all that kind of stuff. That's a whole different thing. That's uh, oftentimes that's related to criminal court work. And there's a difference between criminal court and civil court. And most rehabilitation counseling forensic stuff happens in civil court, which means disagreements or disputes or discrimination or something like that, not crimes. Um, and how therapists fit in that are usually a, like custody related things, but usually that doesn't have quite as much to deal with disability. So I'm gonna leave this out, although there's plenty of room to become a therapist and focus on specific illnesses like I don't know, multiple sclerosis or cerebral palsy or something like that. Um, employment assistance programs. Again, this is not disability related specifically, but employment assistance are when a large employer provides not just medical benefits in terms of, you you know, you will give you insurance or facilitate the insurance so you can go to the doctor, but they'll also deal with mental health benefits as well. It's becoming more of a, a regular thing, but a therapist can have beyond contract or work with employers to provide services to their uh, their employees uniquely, not just accepting insurance or private pay or something. It's just a different system. Um, psychometry, if you're interested in the science or assessment, uh, that's something that might be open to you. Uh, not much more to say about that one. University counseling services, again, this is more related to therapy. But the reason I included here is because the therapists that work at most university counseling services, they just do therapy, the mental health support of students on campus. However, to have somebody who understands disability related stuff and partner uniquely with the disability services or disability student support, that's DSS here, to partner with them and work on campus with that community specifically can potentially look just quite a bit different. One of my first professional presentations that I went to at a conference it was like my first conference and I was like, oh my gosh, the world is so much bigger than I thought it was. And it was like so exciting and stimulating. There was a, a, a student there who was giving a presentation on what it's like to do group therapy with a group of people with intellectual disabilities, which looks a lot different than doing it with a bunch of people with addictions or you know, in um, a bipolar support group or whatever it might be. And so it's a different skill set that is, is helpful to do that kind of work because the therapy just looks different. So uh, that's why I include it here. It's not forensic per se, but it's an option if you want to do this uh, mental health stuff. Standards and compliance offices. This is less about counseling, less about mental health, but the Americans with Disabilities Act, the Family Medical Leave Act, working with the Rehabilitation Service Administration. If you want to work with law and government, if you have interest in politics and policy making, those are great places to use your disability, labor market, uh, and people skills, uh, as we kind of broke it up in our Venn diagram earlier. Great places to do that. And then political advocacy, I think there's not much more to say about that, but um, our skill sets are, are necessary in local communities, on school boards and city councils, but also uh, for you know, state-related issues. When I was starting my book research, I heard about this lady who was a rehabilitation counselor and certified in it. And then she went to work as an advisor to the governor of some state just to help them understand what it, what developmental disability waivers looked like and how much they costed. And you know, it's, a, it's a big part of a budget. And so she helped with the finance and some of the kind of an advisor for decision-making purposes. And then research scientist. We'll just leave it at that. <laughs> I won't say anything about that because it's not forensic. It's not related to, to all the stuff that you're working on. Um, these other things are in the book, and I'll just briefly cover them. But some of the positions that we've talked about do not exist, and they require people to go out and be entrepreneurs and open up opportunities. We know that there are services in our communities that people need, but they don't have. There's no employer there's nobody facilitating those services or those connections between, uh, you know, like to do that case management or, or to provide that kind of transportation support. 
if those services don't exist and people have needs, the question is, who's going to do it? And so there's some information in the book about setting up a business and what that might look like for you, just as a basic entry-level kind of way. A lot of uh, marketing for a business or getting into a career involves networking. It's kind of this like dirty N-word that people don't like it because it's so uncomfortable. But there's some tips in there about networking and what that means professionally and you know, kind of how to present yourself to other people to both find jobs and um, or attract clients, that kind of thing too. There are, I'm a professor in a grad program and I went through a grad program and then another graduate program for my doctoral degree. And so I spent a lot of time learning about how these things are taught and I now get to teach them. There are certain skill sets that don't get taught in grad schools because they're so unique to the private community and particularly the forensic community. So there's a, here's a list of different acronyms that you may want to learn. Uh, and they're kind of explained in, in brief in the book. And then I talk a little bit about how you can go find those skill sets if you don't know them. Uh, just to label them though, so you don't have to leave this thing confused. The Dictionary of Occupational Titles is the DOT. The Occupational Requirements Survey is, people are gonna hate me for this, but it's kind of like supposed to be a sort of equivalent or replacement of, uh, of the DOT or a supplement to the occupational network or the ONET as it's colloquially known. Um, the SOC is the standard occupational class, uh, is that right? Now I'm second guessing myself again. Standard occupational classification is just another numbering system to help the government function essentially. So it can know how, how jobs are classified and what they mean and what kind of things you do in them. There's a whole system there, but that's what that means. TSA is Transferable Skills Analysis, LMS is Labor Market Survey. These are all skills and tasks that you perform if you're doing advanced vocational analysis, stuff like that. And then Earning Capacity Analysis, that is kind of what it sounds. What is your capacity to earn money? Before disability, after disability, that's fascinating stuff and it's complicated and, and I'll just leave it at that, but it's fun, it's interesting. And then, of course, uh, if you're in the class and you're pursuing an advanced degree, what does it mean to go on to grad school? Or since this was written mostly for grad students, is what does it mean to go on to do doctoral work? Sometimes we think of our education as like, I want more and more advancement. Some of us do it because we want to learn and we're just like, there's so much to know. Others of us want more stability and job security or more a higher income, and that's what motivates us. Some of us are just like, I want the biggest challenge I can meet, and then once I get my doctoral degree, I'll feel like I've reached my, you know, I don't know, my goals for myself or something. But what are you actually getting from a doctorate degree, and what is it? What skill sets are you advancing, and do you actually get more prestige and more money and all that kind of stuff? Uh, in some cases, sure. In some cases, no. Not even close. So uh, that's we'll talk. I talk a little bit more about that in the book too. Uh, and then this is just my sales pitch. This is how you find me. This is my website and then on Amazon too. If you want to give Amazon a big chunk of, of your money, then feel free to buy on Amazon. Otherwise, uh, feel free to go here and that means I get more of it. And when I get more money, that means I get to put it back into other projects and do other things. It's not, uh, I'm not getting rich doing this. By the way, uh, I've only, I've, I did sort of a traditional publishing thing where I uh, printed 500 books and now I just have boxes of things in my closet, in my basement. <laughs> and so uh, I'm just basically trying to do two things. One, inform you guys so that you have the options that I didn't have when I was in school because I just want this information to be out there, which is why I send off stuff like this and publish it for free and just tell you about it. And the other thing is I want to pay back how much money I put in so I can break even. And once I do that, I could care less if you buy it on Amazon or wherever else. It doesn't matter to me. I'm not doing this to get rich. So uh, anyway, without with that and without further ado, um, I'm almost nailing my one hour mark. And this just seems to be how long all presentations just go for me. <laughs> so I'm proud I didn't go over. But I love to connect with people too. So if you guys see this and you're like, oh, I want to learn more about something, uh, you can buy the book or you can talk to me or we'll we'll bump into each other at conferences or whatever, but feel free to say hi because I really do uh, do this for the people and now for clients and for students and that kind of thing. So let's not be strangers. We'll just say it that way. So thanks for paying attention if you're still here. Other, and I will just talk to you. Hopefully our paths cross and we'll connect sometime. See ya.